Those of you that helped yesterday, helped pack on Friday, I just want to say thank you. Uh, we had a great turnout for our winter giveaway, had a lot of people, uh, handed out a lot of coats, uh, helped a lot of people. And our goal in that is um, for them to know the love that God has shown to us, and we want to show it to them. We are starting a new Christmas series today called Wine, and this is where God was leading me last week. I told you on the way down to church, God began to lead me in the series, and what I want to do during this series is ask the question, why, when looking at the story of Jesus' birth. For example, why did God choose Joseph to be Jesus' earthly dad? Why did Jesus come as a baby and not as an adult? Why did God choose the shepherds to be the first one to hear of Jesus' birth? Today, we're going to start with why did God choose Mary to be Jesus' mother? I love looking at the lives of the people who played a role in Jesus' birth. And when you look at who played a role, obviously, all the moms in here know that Mary played a key role. We can learn from her as we strive to follow Jesus today, and that's my goal today. There's a song uh, called Mary Did You Know. You've, you've probably heard it. You probably know it. Uh, Mark Lowry, I did it a few years ago, really made it famous. And anytime I hear that song, I always think... You know, there's no way Mary could know what all Jesus would do. There's no way that Mary would know that Jesus would uh, heal the, the sick and the blind would see and the deaf would speak. She knew a little bit, though. And that's the passage we're going to look at today when the angel told her about how she would have Jesus. Uh, she knew a little bit about what Jesus was going to be like, but I'm sure Jesus exceeded her expectations. The cool thing is when you, when you ask Mary, did you know, she did not know all Jesus would do. And that's not the reason why she loved and raised Jesus as her son. Mary loved and raised Jesus because God asked her to. That's the simple truth. Not, not because of what Jesus would accomplish. Not because we would still be talking about her today in 2023. Not because of the glory and the honor that it gave her. It's because Jesus asked her to. And anytime I see someone obeying God with that type of faith, that's someone we can learn from. So I hope we can learn from her today. Before we dive into the passage in Luke chapter 1, let's take a journey. Let's go back to let's just let's just go back to the Garden of Eden right after Adam and Eve sinned. This was thousands of years ago. God knew what needed to happen in order to bring us back into a relationship with him. He had a plan for a long time to the point that we can't even comprehend it. He knew everything that was going to happen and he knew everything he knows everything that is going to happen. And he also knows every person that walked the earth. So let's just go back to when Adam and Eve sinned. Let's say that God, at that point, he could see every single person from then until now and even into the future that he would create. He knows exactly how your life's going to play out. He knows exactly uh, how you're going to live. He knows exactly who you are. And so I believe God, at that point, he examined every person and the life they would live, his options were limitless on who he could choose to be Jesus' mother. He could have chosen for Jesus to come at any time and anywhere through whatever means he wanted. But for some reason, God, when he scanned every person that ever lived, he looked at Mary and said, this woman right here, she's living in a small town called Nazareth. She's engaged to a man named Joseph to be, be there to be married and he says this woman right here this is the one that I'm going to choose to be the mother of Jesus so he foretold, foretold through the prophets about this child that would be born and where he would be born he didn't necessarily tell us that his mom would be Mary but God knew and so then God decides to send this angel Gabriel to this woman to tell her that she is going to be the mother of the son of God. Talk about an announcement. Talk about a wild moment. Yet we can tell a lot about her and why God chose her to be Jesus' uh, mother 
based off her response. So let's look at that. That's in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 33. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of David, not David Whitman, the King David. (laughs) The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and you will give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. That passage right there tells us a lot. He tells her that she is going to be the mother of a child named Jesus. And he is going to be, he's going to be a king that's going to reign forever. Now let's put ourselves in Mary's shoes. We believe Mary at this time is around 15 years of age. Possibly 14, possibly 16, just in that range because that's typically when they would get married. And so the fact that she's engaged to Joseph at this time means it was probably around that age. That is a lot for a teenage mom to face. To be told, hey, you're going to be the the mother of a child that's going to reign forever. Yet God chose her for a reason. And there's a key point in this passage that we had to point out. This is the first reason why God chose her. And it's this. She was favored. That's what the angel said to her, you who are highly favored. She is favored by God. Now the word for favored in that passage means that God has looked upon her gracefully. In other words, he has made her full of grace. He has endowed grace on her. Uh, He has given her the grace that she needs. It can even mean that she... Was He has made her graceful. Obviously, when I read this passage, every time I've read it before, I always think that she's favored by God because God's chosen her to be the mother of Jesus. So I just automatically assume that he's basically saying, hey, you're in an honored position. You're going to be remembered forever and for the rest of the time. You're going to be an honored person uh, even here in 2023. And I think we should honor her, not necessarily like the Catholics do, but I I think we should respect Mary and should honor her for what she did. That's the way I've read this every time before today or for this week. I want to take another route here. When I found out that that word favor means that she was given grace, that grace had been endowed on her, it made me think about the grace that she needed in order to be Jesus' mother. If you're a parent, think about how hard it would have been to have been Jesus' parents. Mom's in the room. You feel more than anyone else when your child is hurting. Yesterday morning, Elijah fell, busted his lip wide open, two spots, bleeding everywhere. I was calm as can be, and Sarah's freaking out over there. I said... Randy said he could see that because he knows how dramatic my wife is. Um, I said, it, it's a lip. He's going to be fine. It's not as if he's on his deathbed or anything. And she's over there. We got to take him to urgent care, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, just going to take him. I'm going to winter giveaway. You're going to take him. But moms, I think, tend to feel when their child's hurting more. So imagine how strong Mary needed to be to see her child ridiculed, drugged through the mud, Uh, metaphorically speaking, but also hunted down, beaten, and eventually put to death. Tell me that she didn't need the grace of God on her life. She needed grace. She needed God's favor. She needed God's goodness poured out on her. 
And I think that's what the angel is saying here. I think he is saying, yes, you are favored in terms of, yes, you're going to be remembered forever. You're going to be honored. But I also think he's saying, God has looked upon you gracefully. And in fact, I think God has given her grace. There's something we call preceding grace. And we normally talk about preceding grace when it comes to fa- salvation. It's the, we understand that we cannot even respond to God's invitation to live in a relationship with him without him first moving in our life, making us able to respond. So grace is the goodness of God. And so when we talk about preceding grace, it's the grace that goes before It is applied to salvation, but I think we can apply it to any situation we face. I have looked back in my life, and I can see that God has given me grace before I face something major. The purpose of this grace is to prepare us for what is to come. For example, if God knows that you're going to need strength to face what is coming next week, or let's say God knows you're going to need the patience to be with your family this Christmas. He's going to start preparing you now, developing that patience within you. Let's say that in a couple years, you need faith to face a health battle. See, God already knows what's coming in two years. So let's say in two years, you're going to be in the hospital bed, the doctor's going to be telling you, hey, I don't know if you're going to make it, blah, 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 blah. And yet you can sense deep down in you that God is still at work and you're full of faith. Why? It's because God's prepared you. He's given you the grace you need. God knows what's going to happen before we ever get there. And so he'll prepare you now to face whatever it may be. That is the grace that goes before. For Mary, she was going to need to be a strong woman to be able to face that all she had to face with what Jesus faced. And so we don't know much about Mary's childhood. But I've got a feeling God was preparing her. I got a feeling God was preparing her to be the strong woman, even as a teenage mom, to know that your child is being hunted down and you got to take him to another country to escape. I think God was preparing her to be the mother of the Son of God. In fact, you can look at her life and say she needed a supernatural touch because all that she had to face was just too much for one person to face. If you're like me, I can look back in my life and I ask myself, how did I get through the things that I got through? When struggles have come my way, when we lost our baby a couple years ago through miscarriage, through the different uh, family struggles and church struggles, and uh, even for me, I can go back to, uh, I went through something called church planner assessment where they interview you for like 10 hours and I was a ball of nerves, yet somehow I got through it just fine because God prepared me. You can look back in your life if you're like me and say, how did I get through that? And the answer is God. The reason why is because God has given you and me grace. In other words, the reason why is because God has favored me and you. He loves us all so much. In fact, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, that even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. It gave him great pleasure. Now this is, he's writing to the church, he's writing to Christians, and he said, even before God made the world, so even before this world existed, you existed in God's mind, and he loved you so much. He says, I'm adopting you into my family. Isn't that a good God? Doesn't that mean that God has favored us? He has given us grace? So this means that in our life right now, just as in Mary's life, we can live with the insurance that God is with us. And because God is with us, we have everything we need to overcome whatever we have to face. Because he will give us grace and favor. He already has. And he will again. 
Mary lived in this favor and grace that she had been shown. So where we're at in this passage is that the angel has told her all about this becoming a mom to the Son of God who will reign forever as king. So naturally, her next question is going to be, how will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. And so Mary answered, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Now, if you're just told, if you don't know what a virgin is, you can ask David on the way out. Um, just told her, she says, I'm a virgin, so how am I going to have a baby? And he says, the Lord's going to come on you, and you're going to have a child. Did you look at her response? Her response was, what? Her response was not, I don't know. I don't know about this. Her response was simply, I am am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. She didn't ask any more questions. She didn't need any more information. She just had a willingness to do whatever God called her to do. If you want to know why God chose her, I think this is a key part right here. She had faith. She didn't need to know exactly how everything was going to happen her faith in God was so strong that she just trusted what God was saying she had faith in terms of belief would we have enough faith in this situation to basically say to God okay sounds good faith according to Hebrews is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see her faith was so strong that she had complete confidence in what the angel was telling her, even if it sounded literally impossible. It's interesting in, in the church most of the time, when we talk about faith, we most of the time talk about faith in terms of our uh, walk with God, or specifically the beginning of our walk with God. We talk about having to have faith that he really is the son of God to repent of your sins to follow him. I don't think we talk enough about the faith that we have to have to continue in our walk with God through all the ups and down seasons of the Christian life. Think about it. When you walked with God for a few years and you heard about his love and mercy and grace... But then you have to face a major health battle or the sudden loss of a loved one. That's tough. It makes you question who God is. The Bible says that this is a testing of your faith to see how real your faith is. We don't talk a lot about you need to have faith to face the battles that you face as a Christian. James tells us in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, that we need to consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and if you let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He says, hey, the testing is going to come. There's going to be trials. Christians do not have an easy walk in life. The devil, when you become a follower of God, the devil puts a big target on your back, and he's going to try to take you out. And so your faith is going to be tested at times, but it's the, the same things that are testing your faith is ultimately what can help your faith to grow. But the key to making sure that whatever's testing your faith actually helps your faith to grow is that word perseverance. Or in other words, don't give up. Keep going. If you keep 
going, if you keep having the faith, ultimately the end result is that your faith will grow into maturity. That's what he said in verse 4. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This truth is the same for us. Many of you in this room had the faith you needed to get your Christian walk started. But make no mistake, your faith will be tested during your Christian walk. The question is, how will you respond? This was a test of Mary's faith. She was walking with God before this. And yet, her faith proved to be genuine. Was her faith going to be tested throughout Jesus' life? Yeah. There's a video we're going to watch at the end. And there's a point when Jesus is being beaten. And um, you can see his mother looking through the bars, seeing her son being beaten almost to the point of death. Her faith was being tested at that moment. Your faith has been tested. How will you respond? With the faith, faith that Mary had or not? We looked at one of Peter's letters last week, and I want to go there again this week. Remember, he's writing to the Christians for being persecuted all throughout Asia Minor. The Roman government has basically come against the Christians at this point. And so in 1 Peter chapter 1, here's what he says. Be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. In other words, these trials are a testing of your faith. Sounds very similar to what James said. And that if you continue to stand, your faith is going to be proven to be genuine. It is being tested <coughs> as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. He says, hey, I know they were being put to death for following God. We think our trials today are bad. Think about that type of trial. They were literally being put on trial for being a follower of Jesus. He said, your faith's being tested just as, as if it was being put through fire. Now what fire does is it tests the authenticity of gold. But <coughs> not only does it test the authenticity, authenticity, not only does it test if it's authentic, but it also burns away what shouldn't be there. Trials tend to have a purifying effect on our life if we allow them to. God will work in our life in ways that uh, he might not can at other times because of our pride. I look around the room in this church, and uh, one, one thing I like about us being a smaller church is that I, I know many of the battles that you guys have faced over the last couple of years. I've been rolled in like two months from people dying in our church or connected to our church. Uh, many of you have lost loved ones that maybe I didn't have any part of. Many of you have been hit with some bad health diagnosis in the last year. Some of you have had work issues, family issues, marital issues. Whatever it may be, your faith has been tried. But you're still here this morning, which is evidence that your faith is still there. And that's what matters. It means that you have persevered, that you've not given up, that you're still running the race. So your faith has proven to be genuine. And if you continue to run the race, God's going to turn it around for your good. We may not have the level of faith that Mary had in this passage. Nonetheless, we should aim to have that level of faith. Because her faith was so high, she accepted what the angel said. And I think that's because she just didn't say she had faith. She lived out her faith through surrendered obedience. I think this was the third reason why God chose her. 
Look at her response in Luke 1, 38. I am the Lord's servant. That sounds like a lifestyle statement. She is saying, I am the Lord's servant. That's how I understand myself. That is my identity, is I am a follower of God. I am a slave to the, to the Lord. I am a servant to the Lord Most High. So may your word be fulfilled to me. This was who she was. Later in this chapter, uh, she emphasized this again through what most Bibles will call her song. But these are words that Luke felt like he needed to write down when he wrote his gospel that Mary had written down or said or sang. She says this, My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. There's that word again. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Notice in that little passage, who is the focus on in that passage? It's God. There is not much about her. When she's talking about, hey, from now on, generations will call me blessed. It's not because of her. Holy is his name. She starts off, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He's been mindful of the humble state of his servant she is focused on what god has done for her she knows there's nothing special about her other than what god has already done in her she's nothing without god and his touch on her life and she's grateful for it and we should be too that's why at the end of verse 38 she said that she wanted the word that the angel said to her to be fulfilled she was willing to face whatever was coming because she was surrendered to god the theological truth I want to teach you from this part is that the Bible tells us that we can either be a slave to sin, which is our, our selfish, sinful nature, or we can be a slave to God. There is no third option. It's slave to sin or slave to God. Romans 6.16 6, says, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, and that's obedience to God, which leads to righteousness. So either you are going to do what your sinful nature leads you to do, which is all the time selfish. It's always what you want. Or you're going to choose to obey God. To be a slave to something means that you're going to say yes to it. So either you're going to say yes to sin, or you're going to say yes to God, there is no third yes. That is your only two choices. And when you go to every decision you make, you're either saying yes to God or yes to sin. Period. Mary had the choice to say yes to God or yes to sin. Would her life been a whole lot easier if she said no to becoming the mother of Jesus. Probably so. She wouldn't have to have seen her son beaten and tortured and put to death on the cross. But we also wouldn't still be honoring her today. She said yes. And aren't we thankful she did? That's the type of life we all should live. We should aim to live out our faith as Mary did by saying yes to God as his servants. That means whatever he calls us to do, we are willing to do it. Because we aren't the master, he is. We're slaves to him. We're not slaves to our own sinful nature. And if we do, scripture promises us that rewards will be waiting for us. Mary was absolutely right when she said in luke chapter 1 verse 48 from now on all generations will call me blessed she was blessed to be the mother of the son of god and not only was she blessed she was a blessing she didn't say yes to god 
because of the blessings that would come her way as a result. She didn't say yes because she knew what Jesus would do. She said yes because she was a servant of God. So we started this sermon by asking why God chose Mary. Well, it's because she was favored by God, just as all of you are. It's because she had faith, as we all should have. And it's because she lived out her faith, in, and as a result, she was blessed. And she raised up a child that would be a blessing to many. Which is symbolic of what can happen in your life if you follow in the footsteps of Mary here. My last point for you is this. As favored people of God, that is your identity. You're favored by God. If we have faith and live out that faith through surrendered obedience, we will see Jesus do great and powerful things just as Mary did. Mary had to go through some struggles as a follower of God. You're going to have to go through some struggles as a follower of God too. But Mary also witnessed Jesus do mighty and powerful things, and she played a key role in that because she played a role in Jesus' birth and raising him up as a child. She got to witness God do powerful things through Jesus, and the same thing can happen to us if we have faith and if we live out our faith through surrendered obedience. Why? Because God's favored you. If you do these things, you're going to see, just as Mary did, Jesus do powerful things through you, and you can say you played a part. Yesterday at the Winter Giveaway, many of you donated coats. Many of you helped us set up tables, tear down tables. You helped us sort through things, a whole host of things. What were you doing? You were serving. You were living this out. You're favored by God. Obviously, you have blessings, so you chose to be a blessing to others by giving coats, by giving clothes, by giving a whole host of things. You had faith, and you lived out that faith. You chose to be here to serve rather than being at home doing whatever else it might have been. And because of that, people were blessed through your work, through your obedience. And if you continue to do that, you're going to continue to see God do mighty and powerful things through you. So the way we want to end today, it's a little bit different. Um, I've asked Maddie to sing Mary Did You Know. And you're, you're going to remain seated uh, unless the Spirit just leads you to stand up. I'm not going to make you go sit down. Um, and as she sings this song, Mary Did You Know, first of all, Mary did not know everything. So you're going to listen to these lyrics and you're going to be reminded that Mary did not know all this was going to happen, but because she chose to live in surrendered obedience to God and to display her faith, because she y said yes to God, she got to witness all this take place. That is symbolic of what can happen in our life if we strive to follow God as well. So I pray that today as you, you listen to this song and uh, we're going to have a video play in during it. And you can sing along, so don't, don't feel like you can't sing. We're going to have the words on the screen. There's going to be a video that plays along with it that takes you from Jesus' birth all the way up into really when Jesus uh, comes back in the book, at the book of Revelation to tell John that he's coming soon. And the clips are coming from the Bible series that came out a few years ago. It's really powerful to watch it, so I hope you'll watch it and take it in. But I want you to examine your life. How are you doing in these areas? Do you have faith today? And are you living out that faith through surrendered obedience? And is your identity based in this that you're favored by God? Because you are. If they'll come on up, I'll pray and we'll get ready.